Greetings fellow cocktailians and fans of BCB. Eric Anderson here, ambassador to Hendrix Gin on the eastern shores of the United States. So, much like the cocktails we make and drink, balance is something that is truly worshipped at Hendrix Gin. So, our seminar is called More on Balance and we feature an exceptional panel of speakers. Uh, tune in and we look forward to seeing you there. Cheers everyone. All right, BCB Global Bar Week uh, of 2020. Uh, welcome to this seminar, which is called More on Balance. I have with me uh, three wonderful uh, people who are going to be presenting three different sides of the, uh, of the aspect of balance uh, when it comes to bartending in general. And we're gonna hit the quite different topics, all of us, uh, and it's gonna be really lovely. I have, uh, well, the, my guests uh, don't need a lot of introduction. I'm sure you know them very well already. Um, we have Dale DeGroff, uh, king of cocktail. Um, not gonna do much of an intro, but I just would like to say, if you haven't checked it out, um, this is the new craft of the cocktail that was released just in, last, uh, in the end of September. So uh, do check that out. We have also, Megan Dorman, who is the bar director of the Dear Irvings and the Rings Law Rooms here in New York City. And Mimi Burnham, who is New York City bartender for, uh, with tremendous experience and now turned virtual bar star through Avital Mixology. So thank you all the three of you for, for joining this. Uh, so as uh, young bartenders, we discovered and we're taught about balancing cocktails at a pretty early stage, right? Uh, from personal experience, I was stumbling my way through the first years as a cocktail bartender, and I realized I could not only have, you know, uh, had the wonderful tasting and colorful liqueurs in my drinks, they needed some type of acidity to balance them. And after a few more years, um, uh, I attended some bar courses, and those facts were you know, verified by my teachers. But I have to say, though, discovering balance in cocktails for ourselves through trying, tweaking, perfecting is one of the most satisfying things for me personally, and uh, gives a sense of achievement and pride when you dip that bar spoon in the shaker, taste those five drops that comes up, and uh, you feel that the liquids are there in complete harmony, in balance. So, balance in our industry is by no means limited to sweet and sour. In an idea world, uh, balance is omnipresent. It circles like a bird in the sky above all aspects of our work. So a balanced bar team, a balanced beverage program, an entirely balanced cocktail beyond the sweet and sour are all vital parts of a success, uh, successful bar operation. So uh, I am now going to turn it over to you, Dale. Um, and I think it would be appropriate to start talking about uh, cocktails and, uh, and martinis. Um, you can find a lot of lovely martinis in the in Dale's book, by the way, on page one sixty eight. Um, but uh, so, when it comes to balancing cocktails, and especially when we take the guests into account, uh, what are the most important things to think about, and uh, how can we approach balance from different ways as bartenders? Well, uh, and by the way, thank you for the book plug. Um, and I'm sitting here in Stonington, Connecticut way out in southeastern Connecticut, uh, and uh, <clears throat> welcome. Uh, I'm missing Brooklyn, I'm missing Berlin. I wish we were really live doing this. Uh, so, I mean, a delicate balance of flavors and cuisine is the basis of all the great culinary traditions around the world. And I think the emergence of the craft cocktail was really her heralded by a return to the culinary roots that kind of underpinned the cocktail. I mean, going all the way back to colonial times, my partner and our friend and the historical or oracle, David Wondrich, went so far as to, in his writings, as to refer to the cocktail as America's first culinary tradition, mm. which I thought was kind of a cool thing. Um, so one particular basic recipe, if, you, uh, if I may continue the larceny from the culinary side of our business, uh, is the ability to balance, balance bitter, sweet, sour, and strong ingredients. And that sounds like an 18th century punch, doesn't it? And that is exactly where the cocktail's uh, uh, basic recipe of sweet, sour, uh, strong, and bitter came from. And uh, 
the recent popularity of shrub-based punches, we're back. We're back to those beginnings. And thank you again, David, for that. Uh, none of this stuff is really rocket science, but, but uh, there is a lot of nuance and a lot of skill involved, and it is more difficult than it sounds. It kind of separates the, the professionals from the amateurs when we get to the sour category, the basic category of, of sours. And the process is complicated by a vast range of bitter, sweet, sour, and strong ingredients, number one. And e each substitution in one of those categories requires balance. And the sticking point is the result has to have a really high degree of deliciousness. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> anyway, it's further complicated uh, because balance is a moving target. We all adjust to sweeten, we all adjust our sweet and sour drinks uh, to meet the needs of certain customers. I mean, it, it may not happen that often, but it happens and it will happen again and again. I mean, there is a window of drinkability within which uh, sour drinks are, are palatable. Uh, I would say 70% uh, of all drinkers find them palatable, if you will. Some We'll consider them standard sour portions a little on the sweet side and others a little on the sour side, but they will think the drink as a whole is a pretty decent drink if we take all the boxes, if we, if we use fresh juices, if we choose good spirits, if it's well shaken, those parts of our job. But our job as professionals is to solve the problem of the other 30%. What do we do about bringing the drink in line with their specific sweet and sour tolerances? Um, if acidity reaches a certain concentration, then most drinkers, with the exception of outliers with a physiology that translates extreme sour as pleasing, <laughs> my partner Steve Olson for one, um, they'll find the drink undrinkable. Uh, the, the tolerance, they'll find the drink drinkable, but most others will find it undrinkable. The tolerance is a bit broader on the sweet side, but <clears throat> in either case, you want to serve a drink the way a guest wants it. I mean, that's the deal. And the key is the server or the bartender's observational skills. And pairing that with the ability to ask one or two questions that will right up front put the person in the 70% or the 30% category. And if you miss that, you still get another chance because you get an answer for sure when the drink is served. And when the customer at that moment of the first sip, we all know what a sour face looks like. And I mean, albeit it's much easier for the bartender to notice than it is for the server. Um, the server. Uh, and by the way, if, if that is the point, the moment when you can sweep in and repair the drink for them. Yes, indeed. Repairing drinks is in fact, uh, should be a regular bartender skill. Uh, if the place is totally bonkers and you really don't have time to hang around and watch the person take their first sip, well, walk by once in a while and take a look at that glass. If that glass remains full for a long time, there's a problem you need to intercede because nobody goes to a bar not to drink. You might pop in and say, is that a little too sour? I can fix that for you. you know. Anyway, uh, we at the regular, at the, at the Rainbow Room, we created a lot of regulars by doing exactly that because people weren't doing that sort of thing, you know, and we were, it, it, it made a difference. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, here's how Harry, Harry Johnson, the famous from the 19th century, framed the conversation in a quote, and I quote, the greatest accomplishment of a bartender lies in his ability to exactly suit his customer. This is especially necessary with cocktails, juleps, sours, punches. He must make a special point to study the tastes of his customers and strictly heeding to their wishes, mix all drinks according to their desire and taste. In following this rule, the bartender will soon gain the esteem and the respect of his patrons. Well, I, I okay. Let's get to the story of, 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 of balance, though, and I'll, I'll get back to that point. Persian, Tahitian limes, Mexican limes, Kaffir limes, yuzu, uh, closer to grapefruit than to limes, regular lemons, uh, Meyer lemons, which is a late arrival to America, early 20th century, grapefruits, the oldest citrus on the world, pomelo. Uh, uh, <clears throat> these, um, we can balance sweet with any one or any combination of these citrus. But remember what Johnson's words of advice where this is especially necessary with cocktails, shoots, sours, and punches. Now, I get punches and I get sours. Okay, that's easy. You know, you got the sweet and you got the sour. I get juleps. You can use crushed ice. You can use more bourbon, a strong drink, and the ice will give you the dilution and the, and the strength of the drink will help to uh, 
to modify the cloyingness of, 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 of an overly sweet julep, or you can just cut down on the sugar. I mean, there's lots of ways of doing it there, but the cocktail, I mean, <clears throat> in Johnson's and Thomas's time, the early 19th century tradition of, of a cocktail with strong spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters, we all remember. That was still prevalent then in mid-century. And in the mid-century, that was the formula in Thomas's book in those nine cocktails that he lists. Um, heavy and <clears throat> Spirit heavy dashes of modifiers, of some sweet and some at least one bitter. The modifiers mid-century were gum, maraschino, curacao, absinthe, and of course, bitters was the offset. So bokers out, paste, angostura, five to one, it seems, according to most books and most recipes. And that was because bokers was really, really bitter, and angostura was actually intended to be sipped from a copita. If you look at the old 19th century uh, advertisements of the beautiful woman with a long dress holding a little tiny copita, and and about to sip her Angostura bitters. And Angostura bitters today would not be in the, cop in the bitters category, the bitters uh, uh, additive category, I should say, the, the, uh, the food category. It would be in the beverage bitters category, but they're grandfathered in, you know, forever. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, Bokers, uh, you know, when I invented my bitters, I, I my, my bitters, this uh, uh, Fiona Gross Pimento is the bitterest bitters on the market. I tell bartenders not to taste it. I know that sounds crazy, but if you do this, it'll give you a, a pretty good idea of what it'll do to a drink or to a dish. I use it a lot in food. And in my Manhattan sessions, I found out when I was doing five bitters that the sweetest was Fee Brothers Whiskey Barrel followed by Angostura and the driest was mine. And by, by, by doing both ends of that, of those five, uh, with several in between, you could make the same Manhattan, the same generic Manhattan, a totally different drink, whether you used uh, the uh, allspice bitters or the or the whiskey barrel or the Angostura. It was phenomenal to see and to taste how how true that was. Um, so that that I think really shows the customer that there there's it's not just about citrus when it comes to to balancing the drinks. I mean, the whole category of the cocktail was based on bitters. And bitters can indeed become the the, modif the, the, ingredient, the modifying ingredient that brings it back in line and in balance. Excellent. There, that's that's super interesting. I think yeah, um, this whole the, the diversity in the bitters category is something that we have uh, we've explored for a little bit, but it's really worth highlighting and working more on it to to construct a beverage program where where bitters actually determine the the um, the balance in a cocktail uh, depending on which one you use and, and I think it's also such important aspects there that you put the guest in the center when we talk about balanced drinks and not what's in the glass only which is not always uh, remembered uh, and it's an aspect that's very important to always bring up that we're not drinking our cocktails it's the guest that's serving them so there's guest that's drinking them so really really great uh, great, great points there. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, awesome. Um, yeah, that's um, re really, really interesting. And I think yeah, the, the key word here being balance and turning over now to you, Megan, um, beverage program is, you know, it's such a large part of the identity of the bar and the cocktail menu is kind of the, the tool, the important tool to communicate it. Um, but what is the, why is it so important to have a, a balanced beverage program? And uh, how can we, how do we make one, first of all? I know you've made uh, many, many by now. Um, and how do, you, how do you use the menu as a tool? And how do you balance the entire program? Yes, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and I love menus. I have gotten to make a lot over the years. And we just talked about balanced cocktails. So now I think we can talk about how we put all these amazing balanced cocktails onto a menu. But I want to zoom out for a minute and talk about kind of menus in general. So, and I know probably people tuning in are all, all different points in their career. And, you know, at a certain point, I made drinks on a menu that was made for me. You know, someone gave it to me. And then I was asked to contribute to menus over time and then more and more put my input into the actual look and use and fonts and everything on menus. So 
no matter where you are right now, collecting this data about menus and how people use them has been really useful for, you know, when you do get another opportunity down the line or in my case where we expanded and I was opening other venues. So I had this info and now I needed to take it to a different location, different neighborhood, different style of service, um, et cetera. So that's, that's another way the menus come into play is thinking about the space that they're being used in and how the guests coming in are interacting. So to clarify that a little bit, I started at Rain's Law Room, which is a little speakeasy downtown uh, New York City by Union Square. And that's like a dark underground place where people are coming to check in, likely for a couple hours, sometimes a lot longer. But last year we opened Dear Irving on Hudson, which is by the theater district. It's a hotel. A lot of times people are coming in just for one drink or you know, a quick drink before they go to a show. So those menus are quite different. One is more of a, a, a book almost, like it fits into this library feel. It has 30 or so drinks on it. The other one is like much taller, slimmer, visually you can see it right away and pull it off the bar. Even if you don't see a bartender right away, you can look through it quickly, make your decision. And, you know, we're playing into how are people using this space, which you can always have a certain idea of. And then uh, you know, the neighborhood and the clientele is going to tell you. So you have to be ready to adapt a little bit in that, in that sense. And then you were talking about the, um, you know, the philosophy, the personality of a place. You can really work that into the menu because it's kind of your physical way of explaining and showing off what you all have decided to do in this venue. So that can not just be the drinks, but Again, the style, the fonts, any other little stories that you add, or we put postcards in our menu because we want people to think about someone they'd love to have a drink with and send them a note, and we mail those off for people. So there's other elements, too, that you can kind of use to extend the experience and um, you know, add a little flair to people's night, which I think is really fun. And that comes along with, ha like, you've had this idea for this space, you have you know, the staff and the decor and you want to balance it all together and then give it to people to, you know, order off of and have the drinks and the experience. So that's kind of the, the bigger picture of menus that I, I always like to think about. And I think is important is, um, especially when people are working as bartenders, servers and barbacks is to really see how people are interacting with the menu and how long the prep is taking to make this menu, how well are we executing for it? How well is everybody trained to guide everybody through this experience? Because, you know, I know myself, I can look at this menu on the computer forever and then I have to give it first to the staff so then they can give it uh, to the guests that are coming in and, and really make it work just like we had in our minds. So that's an important point I always bring up when I talk about menus. And I also like to always get feedback, you know, first it was myself bartending five nights a week. And as I had other people working with me, servers, bartenders, barbacks, you know, how are things going? So an example I always use is when we opened Rain's Law Room, the menu was classics and modern classics. And that really, you know, bartenders knew what it was, but it didn't mean a lot to the people coming in. It didn't help them decipher the menu really in another way, in any other way. And we kind of were talking about it and what we wanted at that point, especially in 2009, was people to be more adventurous about what they wanted, try other spirits, try other brands, things like that. So what we decided to do is set up the menu more by profile. Are you in the mood for something refreshing? Are you in the mood for more of a nightcap, something spicy? That was when, you know, spicy drinks were getting popular and now we can't make enough of those. But um you know, more to guide people by their mood. And that got people to branch out a little more. It got people less tied to what does a modern classic mean? You know, in, in the kind of experience of coming in for a cocktail, it just wasn't resonating with people. So we had to take that and move on. And then we've kept those ideas of kind of profiles and expanded them sometimes not just by flavor, but by something we want to show off. So for example, up at Dear Irving on Hudson, we have a a profile that's more about the Empire State, where we take a deeper dive into locally made spirits, um, local distillers, things from the Hudson Valley or ingredients, because we're in this big hotel in Times Square, a lot of international travel. We want to add like an extra layer of New York flavor to their experience, something a little more organic and authentic than they might be getting 
you know, in the, in the rest of their trips. So we've kind of expanded on that over the years. And that's really what do we want to show people, but also what's the information we're getting from guests and how they're interacting with this menu. Um, and then of course the drinks that are actually on it, which now is a very collaborative process, which is really fun. Uh, when we were just operating Reigns, for the most part, I wrote the menu there. And it was always a mix of classics and kind of modern creations from us because we are like very steep there in that classic cocktail culture. It's very small. We don't have a big area for prep or special syrups and stuff. But again, like we, we want to commit to those classics as well. Whereas the other locations, what's our philosophy? It's a little more playful, a little more whimsical. We have more of a kitchen situation we can expand on that in the menu. And it's really important for us at all the locations that there's a big variety that anyone coming in off the street could find something they liked. And that's, that means a lot of things, a lot of different spirits, a lot of different formats in terms of low ABV, strong and stirred, you know, spicy wine based wine and beer selections. Um, because we've really seen, who's coming in and why. So we get a lot of people entertaining clients. So the client doesn't always necessarily know where they're coming. They haven't looked it up on the internet. They don't know. They're also maybe in a business setting. They just want something a little lighter or a glass of wine. Great. We're not going to be mad that we're a cocktail bar and you're ordering rosé. Whereas at Rain's Law Room, a lot of times it's later night traffic. It's kind of after dinner nightcaps. Uh, people that are a little more... Um, into cocktails or things like that, a little more adventurous. So it's, it's a bigger menu, uh, more ingredients that, you know, we're happy to explain, but people might not be familiar with. At the hotel, it's definitely more of a mix because we do want people to be familiar with things, be able to order quickly, get in and get out. And then there's definitely room for conversation as well, which I think is important on menus. It's like give a lot of information for the people that want to order quickly or that might know more but also leave a little room for a chat for people deciding between drinks, um, you know, to make that connection with people. And that does go back to the training on the menu that I was talking about before. So I really like to balance in terms of a variety of spirits, but also like profiles, serves, um, all different kinds of flavors. So people, you know, really can find, you know, the idea is there's something for everyone on this menu. So that's the balance that I'm always going for on my menus. That's really, really interesting. And you know, you have, you have so, so much experience of building menus and in different parts of the city as well. Um, it's not, um, it's not um, only important to tailor to what country or what city or what borough or even area you're in. It's can be, a beverage program can be tailored to in even smaller geographic entity, like in terms of, you know, just 10 blocks. And especially mm -hmm. the Daring on Hudson is, is, is a great example of that, that the crowd up there is, is quite different from the one down in, in um, uh, Irving Plaza, or uh, yeah. the, the Irving, the, the first one. Um, that's super cool. And I think this, use, this information is super useful for bartenders who are um, a little bit more senior and you're starting to make your, uh, your marks on the cocktail programs uh, and the cocktail menus. Maybe you get a cocktail on the menu and maybe you get two and then you start to make your, uh, design your entire menu yourself. So that's, I think that's, that's super valuable information for, for um, uh, aspiring bartenders becoming, you know, bar managers and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Megan. Uh, that's such, um, uh, such important aspects that we brought up now. And uh, what I think we thought was re really interesting is to talk about the balance of a bar team and how we can make uh, and bring a diverse bar team and, you know, get the balance from all the great personalities that we all work behind the bars with. Uh, I mean, as bartenders, we all know that it's some of the most diverse uh, workplaces there are in the world, which is amazing. So, uh, flipping it over to you, Mimi, here. Um, first of all, what an amazing bar you got there. Uh, <laughs> looks amazing. My home bar. <laughs> well, if it wasn't COVID times, so I would almost invite myself over uh, <laughs> for a martini. Um, but, you know, uh, so much like the ingredients in a cocktail, we're all very different. Uh, each, uh, like the cocktail ingredients are different each on their own. And uh, let's just consider, you know, lemon juice, gin, simple syrup and champagne. Uh, 
exceptionally wonderful, uh, yet completely different creatures on their own. But together, when mixed appropriately, perfectly balanced, French 75, Gin 75, that is. Um, bartenders and former bartenders, we are also a very diverse bunch, and I can't imagine myself meeting so many interesting people in my career if I wasn't in this industry then. So Mimi, can you please shine some light on the advantages of a diverse bar team? And what are your best recommendations to nurturing the balance within a work team? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, greetings, Eric, Dale, and Megan. Pleasure to be here, thank you for having me. Um, so, you know, we have to talk about um, the key words that are involved in, you know, bar teams. So inclusion, uh, by definition, is um, a basic universal human right, okay? It's to embrace and respect all people, regardless of their race, gender, age, disability, religion, identifying sexual orientation, what have you, all of that, the adherence to that and respect to that becomes equal access opportunities, um, ending discrimination and intolerance, and this affects every aspect of public life and society in general, okay? And then when we talk about diversity, diversity actually is the uh, traits and characteristics that make people unique, okay? So we use these two words together, inclusion, inclusion and diversity, because they're very, very important foundations and core bedrocks to our human society. Okay, we feel, I feel like lately we've gotten a little bit away from the inclusion, maybe the past 50 years or so, um, but that's okay because the meter's moving back, you know, and I have faith, I'm an eternal optimist. So when we think about the foundation for bar spirits and professionals, um, hospitality is probably the most important base, and I'm gonna call it as a, as a, as a core bedrock of our, gen, of, of our whole being and sense of work, okay? Um, it is the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, strangers, uh, visitors alike. Uh, we have to respect and include everyone in their experience because we're creating an experience for each guest, right? Ideally, when they come to our bar um, in non-COVID times, um, they you know, can drink at home as we're finding, <laughs> which is what's happening now. Um, and we need to create an experience for them, you know, whatever it is. Sometimes it's you know, a lot of interaction with the guests. If you can, you know, I do high volume craft cocktail bartending. It's very difficult, but I always try and touch my guests in some form or manner. I never want anybody to feel that they're alone. Okay, this is a very important part of balance in your working ethos and your ethics as a bartender. Um, you know, bartenders love history. So I'm just gonna throw a little bit of history at us because I happen to be a history buff. I think most of us are. That's why we embrace classics so hard and, um, that's how people like uh, David Wondrich and uh, Robert Simonson and even Dale make a living, which is a great thing because we, we just adore the history of cocktails, right? So a little bit about um, recorded human history and hospitality. Um, back to the ancient Greece, when we, you know, when we were first like doing real bona fide recorded human history, the ancient Greeks um, revered hospitality as an actual right, okay? It wasn't even like a question. It was a part of their whole democracy as a civilized uh, group, okay? So the respect of that and how you behaved hospitality-wise would really actually put the balance of like, it would dictate who you were socially and if you would get a noble title, okay? This also was very paramount in um, India and Nepal. Um, the principle is that the guest is God. Um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, every all of those religions praise hospitality. Even Celtic cultures that we're so afraid of, Vikings and you know, the crazy Scots back in the day and stuff, um, they felt that hospitality was protection. If the host um, agreed to your staying at their fort or camp, etc., cetera, um, they provided food, shelter, and most importantly, safety. So it's interesting how hospitality and safety came, you know, the, the meter changes on that as we progress in our civilized society. Um, and we have to embrace this truth because there's, there's no bias or judgment, you know, that we should ever have when it comes to a preconceived personal opinion about anybody. This includes our team that we work with, which is very, very important, okay? Yes, there's so many personalities behind the bar. Um, you know, are we very um, extroverts? Typically, you know, is there some introverts in us? Yes, because this is about balance, okay? Um, not everybody's gonna be, um, you know, the star of the show, nor should they, okay? A truly diverse uh, bar team has to have a balance. This is really, really important. But the balance really starts with how we respect and engage with each other, 
Okay. So I'm going to address that specifically. We know that we're never going to judge a guest when they walk in the door ever, because that's just like, you know, you're in the wrong industry and you need to leave and, you know, go back to, uh, to a different line of work. Okay. I'm just going to call it for this. But if we aren't judging our guests, then why are we judging our fellow employees that we work with behind the bar? And this is a critical error in any bar program. I've had um, lots of experience working in different bar programs for a great many amount of years, more than I care to count. Um, I keep lying about, about my age, so that's how that goes. <laughs> but in the reality of things is, if I collect I really feel like the best bar team works as a hive, okay? And that we all are like, you know, worker bees doing our thing. And we all do them really well because we're well-trained. You know, we take advantages of trainings. We, you know, take advantages of reading um, after work about cocktails and self-educating because it is a career and we take it seriously. And, um, you know, any time that we can maybe engage, maybe once a month or so, I'm not saying all the time. I'm not a proponent of drinking on site where you work. I think that's a terrible idea. I don't like the optics of it. But I really believe it's important for people to take time and, and go and co mingle with their coworkers is very important. So go share a pint, but do it off site. And once a month is a great thing because you need to have that camaraderie. You know, when it's like three deep and you're like, you know, crushing it, doing double shaking and just, you know, trying to do all the hospitality and touch guests and, you know, can I split this 10 ways? Of course you can, you know, so <laughs> 10 credit cards, you know, it's, just, it's okay, you know, so this is all things that we need to count on each other because if we aren't each other's spines and if we're not uniquely, you know, with each other in the right same ethos, then it's a big, big problem. So as I say, um, it's a hive, okay? Now every hive has a queen bee. So the queen bee is the guest period. All right. There is no other queen bee. It doesn't matter. You know, head bartender is respected because they make sure the program's adhered to, you know, nobody should be making cocktails and other responsibilities. Of course, nobody should be making cocktails differently than anyone else. You know, yes. Is there some bartenders with a skill set that have followings from previous employee and people come in there, Hey, can you make me that drink that you used to make me at this other place? You know, the bespoke cocktail situation. That's really the only time that you're going to vary off of this. But the bar program, as Megan um, really does amazingly when she designs cocktail menus, may I say, um, is that it's always so consistent, okay? And consistency is key in our industry. So consistency and balance are important because if you come to work and you're in a bad mood, you know, your cocktails aren't going to taste good. I'm going to tell you right now. If you have negative emotions around you and you're coming to work and you just like got a sourpuss face on, your cocktails are going to taste awful and you're never going to get over it. And it's never, it's going to affect the whole team. It's like a cancer. Okay. So we have to really respect and remember and have some gratitude for the fact that we're working. Okay. I know it sounds corny, <laughs> but it's one of the you know values and, and key core keys to my being is that I am always super grateful that I am employed and working in a certain establishment. Okay. Um, have I had, you know, situations where, you know, I can't really carry like personal grudges and, and, and have judgment against others. Okay. Even though many times I've worked with people and they've been very negative, you know, all kinds of crazy things. We all have stories. You can't let this affect you. You have to let it roll off you. You are not that, you know, um, when everybody embraces everyone's strengths, which is a wonderful thing that we embrace people's strengths. I happen to also look at people's weaknesses and I try and understand that better. And it gives me the ability to understand the individual more. So now I'm like a little more sensitive and a little more in tune to why, what it is about their, you know, shortcomings or, you know, maybe sadness or something, you know, not, I don't want to get too into their business because that's not professional, but I also want to pay respect to um, what it is that maybe may not make them shine as much as all of us are. You do never speak to anyone else about it because this is very important. Um, then you will find that the gelling of the team gets even tighter because now you become family. I can't tell you, I've been, like I said, I've been in this industry a long time and I've been very lucky in having a great amount of respect. And I think it's because I maintain myself in this type of discipline. All right. Um, I just like to have enthusiasm. It's consistent. It's not fake. You know, it's who I am. It's the ethos. I am a happy person. You know, 
Um, Danny Meyer, who was a previous employer of mine for numerous years, you know, wrote that wonderful book, you know, Setting the Table back in 2008 now. And we all read that book, you know, and if you haven't, you probably should if you're in our industry. But one of the things that he cites is that um, there's a 51% and a 49%. So the 51% is your emotional job performance. How do you perform emotionally? I can't teach you that. The 49% is the technical. I could teach everybody that. Okay, I can teach anybody how to make cocktails. I can teach them even how to interact with the guests to an extent, but I cannot teach you to have a personality or emotion or to be emotionally involved in your job and be present in the moment. Okay, one of my biggest pet peeves is seeing people on a phone when they're working. I can't stand it. You know, if you're looking for a cocktail on the phone, go back. It's just a terrible look. It means the guest means nothing and there's no balance in your team. So for nurturing um, a bar team, it's really about that. It's about understanding people. And yes, we embrace our strong people because it's easy and we're just so used to doing that. But do take time to understand the other side, maybe the quieter people, maybe people that aren't always, you know, do you see them and they're just going through the mechanics of work, but they're not engaged. And it's really up to us to help engage them. You know, and it, it's it, like I said, it sounds a little corny, but I, you know, you need to have gratitude probably more so now than ever. This was a great awakening for everyone. And, uh, you know, I think that also the sense of humor is probably the first and foremost paramount thing of any job as a bartender. I mean, we have the, we are the luckiest people that we have a job where we can like be playful and have fun and laugh. It's like the best job in the world. You know, it's the best um, job in the world. I have a bartender. That's just a terrible thing. You know, cocktails without pretension is very important. So those are the factors that I care about. You know, I'm no expert in the psychology of a bar team, but you know, these are the things that we all have to uh, pay attention to and, and just be respectful of others. You know, it's long overdue and it's time. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, maybe. And based on like our conversations previously, I think that you bring a lot of uh, super interesting aspects into the um, the world of uh, sort of in the balance in the team and how to how to sort of prevail as a bar team. And it's also a great uh, deep dive into the origins of his hospitality, which I think is super cool. And uh, like, um, if we were all the same in a bar team, if everybody was the same, like how would we grow and learn from each other? So um, super, super cool. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you all three for those uh, really interesting aspects of it. Um, I'm gonna just throw out all the three topics in a hodgepodge at you like this. A little bit. I know you, Dale, started making fantastic cocktail menus uh, at the Rainbow Room in, was it 1988, the first menu? 87. <clears throat> 87. Yeah. Yeah. And how did it, because you constructed essentially two different beverage programs in 87 and 98, right? My first menu right here. <laughs> I've had the privilege of looking at this one a few times before, but it's 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 super good. But like how because you you made um, two different menus with ten years apart. I mean several uh, different menus in between. But how did you learn from that experience? Oh my God, uh, we that first menu had twenty six drinks, uh, champagne drinks, non alcoholic drinks. Uh, even though we'd had a long training period, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't expect the, the onslaught. I mean, when they opened the doors back in 1987 at the Rainbow Room, there was no friends and family. There was no warm-up period. It was, it was pandemonium. And it, these were difficult drinks. I mean, there's 26 really uh, uh, labor-intensive drinks on this menu, and we really hadn't thought about shortcuts. <laughs> so... Six months in, I had to take this beautiful Milton Glaser graphic menu and walk into Joe's office and say, Joe, we got to redo the menu. He was hoping. No one had made in a long time. And he didn't want me fooling around with him too much. You know what I'm saying? He wanted the original recipes, real ingredients, no shortcuts. So I explained the problem and I said, we need a smaller menu. I need to get some, some systems in place that I didn't realize I needed. You know, I learned on the job and, and by the year, by year one, we had found those systems. We were doing, we were actually doing uh, 
uh, semi-batching in the back service bar area, not at the main bar, at the front bar. We did everything all in minute. But we realized that the Singapore Sling, you know, you can put, put those four spirits in the Singapore Sling and then use that as the base. You know, you can, there were, you can take that Long Island iced tea, and put, and which was hugely popular at the time we opened uh, Rainbow, and have those spirits in there as the base. You know, we didn't need to grab every one of those bottles every time we made that trick. So we put all those systems in place and we made a smaller menu and it worked, you know, uh, and, you, and the employees were happy. That if the employees can't function, it, it, it's no good. And learning, one thing we did learn early on was is to order to the menu. And that, that became a critical mm -hmm. issue. Uh, so yeah, that, it, there was a lot to think about um, and a lot of learning on the job. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's one of those jobs that it's not like we go in, and learn bartending and then suddenly now you're a bartender and that's it you know it is a learning on the job kind of job which is you know what i like a lot about it it's it was my second head bartender job and i didn't realize how many jobs that entailed you know you were steward of the bar you know you had to order all the ingredients everything and make sure they were always there you know there were so many things you were you know i had 36 i had 34 bartenders you know and the interaction between those bartenders i had bartenders from africa i had bartenders from england i had bartenders from america i had several women on the staff which joe would not allow me to put at the front bar which i i was it was a blow and i ended up losing half of them behind that but that was another era you know it was the, it was 87 and you, in midtown you didn't see a man behind any fancy cocktail bar uh, you may be shocked by that, but that's that's the way it was, you know. Wow, the different times, definitely. Yeah. Um, Megan, you, you've fostered and nurtured many bar teams over the last yes. um, several years here, many years. Um, what are the things that you have, uh, why are you so good at it? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, what Mimi was talking about reminded me something, Dale, in 2010, actually, when I was taking bar five day, I brought a, a couple of bartenders from Australia into Reigns and he was just so surprised that everyone drank there. And I was like, I don't really know what you mean. Um, and he, he was saying how where he was from, bars were only like young people, like both that worked there and went in, like 20 year olds went out and he didn't know like what you did after you turned 30 basically. Um, and he was like, all ages, all races, same sex couples. And, you know, I have to say like, it made me look at it harder, but I do think a lot of that balance of who comes in is also about who works there and like the team that's together. People are gonna feel most comfortable in a place where somehow they feel reflected or that people can understand them. So it's it's been so helpful to me. And I think cocktails, they kind of came from this like fine dining idea of like who is the best to serve and take care of people or, um, like speaking perfect English all the time. And, you know, we have changed, maybe not enough, but, you know, it's most helpful to me to have all kinds of people working here because it has means all kinds of people come in and feel comfortable. But also being in New York City, we have people that speak several languages. We have people of all ages. It's not only, you know, 23 year olds that will work till two o'clock in the morning. Like people have to change their mind about that sometimes. Um, or that who can, <laughs> Who can lift things? Who can move things? Who can have the best effect telling someone no? You know, it's actually all different kinds of people and personalities. And going back to balancing a menu, it's been so great for me to work with people that come up with drinks that I would never think of or are familiar with flavors that I'm not. At uh, Dear Irving Gramercy, we have uh, quite a lot of Latin American bartenders. So we did a section on the menu and, you know, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Guatemala, Mexico, you know, we all like sat down, talked about what it was about holiday drinks, you know, what were they familiar with having around the holidays? And we got to adapt that with, you know, what we have at the bar, what's available to us. And it was, it was really fun and it's gone over really well. So I think both on the team, but also the guests, you don't want to just rely or attract one kind of clientele or person both for the dynamic, but I think for the overall health of the business as well. What a great way to integrate the, the bar team into, into the program and have them be um, an instrumental part of uh, what you're doing in, in terms of drinks and stuff. Super cool. Thank you. Uh, 
Mimi, any uh, uh, parting words here? Uh, we are, uh, you, it was such a lovely, lovely talk that you had just now. Um, we don't have a tremendous amount of time left, but I would love to hear your, uh, your take on, on the cocktails and balance for a little bit. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so getting back to like um, hiring as Megan touched based on, it's so important that we keep our bar teams and our front of house and back of house for that matter, the entirety of our facility very diverse because it's a true snapshot of what the world is. You know, we don't want to be a single note wonder. We want to take, you know, I, I'm, I'm a capitalist in basic nature and, you know, everybody's money is welcome. So why not welcome everyone that's enthusiastic onto the staff, you know? So these are very important things that we need to remember. And, um, you know, the core in the end is just, you know, um, being respectful and, and, you know, trying to stay happy is first and foremost for me. You know, if, um, if you're not having express, you know, feeling happiness at your place of employee, it's probably time for you to um, leave and go somewhere else. And I know that's really hard to do as a bartender. I could tell you for a fact that sometimes we get caught in a corner and, you know, we're just intimidated and we're scared and basically it's our own insecurities speaking. But when you're not having fun behind that bar anymore in that particular establishment, it's time to dust off your resume and find a new place. So let's see if we can be true to ourselves going forward in 2022 it's you know? very it's like quite tough words but it's a very very true as well and i think it's been a big wake-up year for a lot of us uh, in the industry from uh, uh, from behind the bar but also from uh, the other side of the bar yeah that, you know we were looking at what, what we've been doing here all the time and it's it's a great year for reflection i think um yeah. so um before we run off i just want to say thank you for everyone for tuning in on this the bcb global bar week it's a super cool thing this is the first time it happens we're bringing um well bartenders from all over the world and uh, i'm very proud um and extremely happy to bring all of the, your um your faces in uh, megan mimi and uh, dale the uh talking about the importance in balance and more on balance. We can talk about balance in our industry for many days. And uh, so uh, this was um, a little snapshot of what I would like to, to contribute with here. So uh, once again, from uh, Hendrix Jin, thank you very much for tuning in everyone. And uh, I hope that you have a great rest of your week, Global Bar Week. And uh, I hope that this year, will pass as soon as possible so we can get on with making cocktails and making people smile. Yes. So. That was up to that. <laughs> Any parting words, guys? Oh, thank you and keep the faith, you know, this too will end. I'm sure everybody who's clever and smart enough to open a bar will be able to be clever and smart enough to open another one. I know we're gonna lose some. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say hi to everyone. I know uh, we are all going through it at the moment, but hopefully the collective energy of being somewhat together this week helps everybody move forward. And I'm looking forward to visiting you all as soon as I can. That goes back, like, back at you. I'd mm. like to stay, um, be safe, you know, stay safe, wear a mask, be sane and be happy. Cheers. Cheers to that. Uh, and uh, tune in for more seminars on the BCB Global Bar Week. There's so much going on out there. You can follow us on Instagram if you want and all of those fun things. So thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, we'll see you in a bar uh, soon near you. Cheers, everyone. So. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to BCB Global Bar Week. This is awesome. Uh, we have a whole Global Bar Week. Uh, we're all united on the same Zoom, Zoom umbrella. Um, thank you first for joining the seminar. The first time we're doing all this virtual. So I'm, I'm very impressed that so many people could join in and they get the technology of all of this. Um, my name is Eric Anderson, ambassador to Hendrix Gin here in New York City. I look after the East Coast uh, to the gin. I've been working on the Hendrix for coming up to, um, yeah, on the ninth year now, I think. Uh, so we, I'm in, absolutely in love with all things gin here. I would uh, 
really, really like to answer as many of your questions as fast as possible because there's so many questions coming in. And we're delighted for it. So I'm just gonna go right up in there and throw a couple of speed rounds. Um, as you saw on the on the seminar, we have, of course, Dale DeGroff, uh, Mimi Burnham, and Megan Dorman here with us. So intros uh, now done. Here are the first questions. So if you think about a particular cocktail that you had somewhere in the world, uh, anywhere in the world, really, uh, that was particularly well balanced, what was the drink? Where were you? And maybe you even remember the person who made it for you. Uh, so I'm flipping it over. Let's flip it over to Dale DeGroff first. Uh, that's, that's easy. Cafe Pacifico London, margarita, well-balanced. Maybe the Hunter Thompson margarita in particular. Tomas Estes. Beautiful. Excellent. Uh, how about you, uh, Megan? Well, I'm on a global quest to find the best espresso martini and the espresso martini at Salmon Guru across the Atlantic was A+. Plus. Excellent. I like that. Mimi? I had a beautiful cocktail um, years ago when I was in Cabour in Normandy, and it was made with pommel, a little calvados, and some zoos. It was a bespoke cocktail, and it just blew my mind open. And I've been seeking that unicorn ever since. <laughs> seeking the unicorns. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and the espresso martinis, my dear colleague, friend, and um, mentor here in New York City when I arrived almost four years ago, Trevor Schneider, uh, he's done a couple of espresso martinis as well. So we'll make sure to consult him after this yes. with his Reika okay. vodka. Uh, cool. The second one will be, what cocktails are the most underrated ones? And uh, let's go with Mimi first on this one. Okay, so underrated, as in commercial establishments, I'm going to go with punch. Um, I noticed that not enough of us make punch. Some do. Some prolific places make punch. But a lot of us underestimate the power of punch. You can prepare it beforehand, bottle it, you know, have it for sale. So I'm going with punch. Punch, punch for the people. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> Megan, how about you? I think um, Pisco cocktails are always... Um, not as popular as I wish they would be. Um, I, it's a lovely spirit, floral, light. So I would love to see that get a little more shine. Excellent. Dale? Well, I think in the craft world, there's a lot of folks who look down on the Long Island iced tea. I made hundreds of thousands of them at the Rain Room. The caveat is that you need to put only a half ounce of each of the spirits or else you're gonna blow people out of their chairs and that's unnecessary. And also you have to use fresh lemon juice, but it's a, it's a spectacular drink when it's made properly with good spirits. Totally great. That's, yeah, that's great. And the way that you used to pre-batch them back there was so clever. Yeah, There's, too, uh, yeah. we have, um, <laughs> We have a lot of, uh, we can have, look at this question in more seminars in the, in the future, but uh, that was a particularly cool one, I think. Um, the third one for the speed round is, um, if there's a mainstream cocktail, uh, drink of choice for you, which one you take? And that one would go to you first, Megan. Um, so I love the Boulevardier. It was actually on the menu at Dear Irving on Hudson as an exercise and balance, uh, because I just, I think it's just, a lovely, perfect mix. Great one. Uh, what do you say, Mimi? I like gimlets. I, I just love a gimlet, like just one before I eat as, an, as a true aperitif, and then I'll slide into other cocktails, uh, preferably gin, gimlet. It tells me a lot about a bartender when I have a gimlet. Boom. Great, yeah. Yeah, I just love it. Dale, what you got? Uh, my, that was my dad, Mimi. Uh, so uh, martini, of course, gin martini. But you know, you can't answer that question anymore with just the martini, the gin martini, because there are so many really interesting gin martinis now. I never drank fitty, fitty, fitty martinis in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but now I am, you know. You know, it depends on do I want to relax or do I want to stay sharp? It's the deal, you know, what kind of a martini I drink. <laughs> Good question. Good answer. Thank you for those three questions coming in early on the seminar. I appreciate you guys. 
Um, now we're going to go to a little bit more elaborate questions. We don't have a ton of time on them, but a couple of minutes on uh, for each of you. And I want to go with, back to you, Megan, on uh, because I know that you have been uh, on a little bit of a on a quest to uh, when you're building your program over at the uh, Hudson now. And uh, tell us a little bit more about what drink that you have really worked on. Yeah. So as I was saying, I love Pisco. Um... We spoke a little bit about, you know, balancing out a menu. And when we were rebuilding the menus, um, of course, they're a little bit shorter. But I also thought about what the staff was so passionate about before we closed and like hopefully boost the morale a little bit by keeping on things we were working on. So one drink in particular is called Con Passion. It's under a profile that's all women makers and distillers and blenders. So that's the ladies from Machu Pisco. Amara Nonino, uh, some Chinola passion fruit to like go back to that Peru bright kind of floral earthiness that I love about Pisco. Um, and it's like a nice stirred, elegant drink. So we have that on the menu and it's like slowly picking up steam. But overall, I think, yeah, Pisco is just like, it's so bright and both earthy and floral. So it plays so well in drinks. I wish um, people would kind of venture out a little bit more and both use it and drink it because we got to have people drinking it to put it in our drinks. And distilling it in the way the Pisco is distilled, it retains so much of the character of the, mm. of the grapes that it's made from. So it feels like it's from Mother Earth, really. Um, yeah, I always so recommend it to wine drinkers, actually, because, you know, if you appreciate like Sancerre and Savion Blanc and uh, like Muscat and things like that, like you would really appreciate drinking Pisco, I think, as well. Heard. I like that. Um, so back over to you, Mimi. And uh, oh, actually, let I want to touch on cocktails first with you, Dale, real quick. Uh, um, well, a few minutes at least. The next big trends on cocktails, two minutes. That's a very, very short time of talking about this. But uh, what, what, what's, what's in your head on this one? Well, you know, the culinary cocktail is the, is the new thing that started with the craft cocktail movement. And it's not, it doesn't show any uh, signs of, uh, of, of going away. I mean, we're just getting more and more, and more unusual ingredients in our cocktails. Uh, and more more culinary uh, techniques in our cocktails as well. Um, RTDs, I think, will be a, a, a big deal, especially after COVID. Uh, they'll be growing. More people will be doing them. And I think more people will be doing things like retail sales in their bars because it's another profit center. I think that's really good. That, that, that's awesome to hear. And Barton is listening now because uh, um, we're not, no bars are art galleries. Every bar is a business unit, and uh, we need to find ways to make to make money. And I think a lot of people, I mean, bartenders, home bartenders are learning to make drinks, and we have a lot of online bartenders, like you know, all the four of us here are making drinks online. But at the end of the day, uh, I think a lot of consumers just want a great cocktail made from uh, a professional bartender. And having to go drinks from bars, it will remain a business opportunity for a long time. That's, yeah. Thank you, Dale. That, that's a really good reminder to bartenders to build out a beverage program to a bit more to go. Um, we have, okay, so Mimi, I yeah. would like to ask you this one. And, you know, this is also a very big question, of course. And, you know, the, the cocktail climate of today. And, like, where do you, where do you see it uh, developing in, you know, from uh, this year and beyond? Ah, so... I think a significant portion is going to be virtual. Okay. This world has been open to us between Zoom platforms. I myself am now a Zoom bartender. Um, I call it new world bartending. Um, there's nothing to fear. It's okay. We just have to figure out to keep the revenue stream tight. I'm with um, you and Dale and Megan. All you guys saying that, you know, RTDs is where, where it's at. Uh, we do need to make cocktails to go because even though we're teaching consumers at home, they still aren't getting like the way we make it is just a different kind of mojo. So we need to pay attention to that. And that's definitely significant and it is not going away. So between, uh, you know, canned uh, point of sale, you know, purchases and uh, virtual aspects of bartending. That's, that's my two cents about that. And, you know, yep. Excellent. No, thank you for that. And it's, we know that obviously after seven months of heavy using, uh, Zoom now, uh, nothing go, nothing can compare to sit in a bar and drink a cocktail. You know, it just yeah. doesn't, just doesn't work. Um, 
Uh, hopefully we can facilitate people making great drinks at home. But in the end of the day, we need we need to get back and have open bars whenever that happens and, and keep supporting our industry and the great bartenders out there. I think it's um, number one, two and three priority. Yep, absolutely. And uh, thank you for all the bartenders are tuning in who are hanging in there, wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's really tough, basically, uh, anywhere in the world. So thank you for all the hard work that you're doing and uh, hang in there, everyone. Sorry. We will come up on the good side of this one. Excellent. We have. Uh, do we have any parting words and uh, and thank yous from from you guys? I'll just leave it open to you. Um, I'll just agree with what you said that we'll all need each other to get through this, and hopefully, this little bit of community this week gives you all some insight, but also some energy to get back to it. And you know, we're all figuring it out as we go. But I'm happy to be back in my liquor room, as you can see where I am. <laughs> I just love it that you stuck in there. Thanks, Megan. That's amazing. Uh, what you got, uh, Mimi? Yes, I just um, I agree with Megan. I think we all need to embrace each other really hard right now and lean on each other. There's nothing wrong with this. You know, I'm here for you. You're here for me. We can get through this. Just wear a mask and be smart and safe. And you know, we're going to come through this on the other side. We're going to be better. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, I feel that these are clever, really talented people that, and some of them are gonna lose their bars, but that their, their cleverness and their talent is not gonna go away and this thing's gonna end. And I, I would suggest that we're gonna come roaring back in, in a year and a half or so. It's just, you gotta get through this year and a half and do whatever you gotta do to do that. Do whatever jobs you gotta do to make money and make it happen, uh, but it'll be back strong I'm, I, I'm not, I have no doubt thank you these are great words from a, a wonderful panel um, Megan Mimi Dale thank you so much for uh, uh, for being here and uh, if you guys haven't checked it out new craft of the cocktail is out oh, in uh, in an <laughs> online bookstore near you uh, Excellent. I can well recommend it. It's amazing. Uh, Megan and Mimi, thank you for all the great work that you're doing in the bars and on the Zooms. Um, BCB Global Bar Week, you are amazing. You pulled a virtual Global Bar Week together. That's the first one in the history of mankind. Yeah, so right. bravo to that. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, you can check us out online, uh, hendrixgin.com. My uh, Instagram is youngmrflanagan. Dale has his Instagram, King Cocktail, Megan, the Ginger Ricky, and Mimi on Smart Olive NYC. So thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you very, very soon. Take care.